You know, as we wade down these small streams or creeks with, or walk through these forested paths to get to these creeks that are just wonderfully wooded and shady, it's easy to forget um, or possibly not even realize that just a little over a hundred years ago, these streams looked a lot different than they do today. Much of the eastern United States, including the southeast, were heavily logged once, once upon a time. And uh, if you see pictures of the south back in the early part of the 20th century or the latter part of the 18th century, one of the things that you, can, you might, might stick out to you is a conspicuous lack of trees. Well, there's a reason for that. It's because they logged them. Um, and that was a much greater and more widespread practice back in the day than it is these days. Of course, we still have uh, a lot of logging going on, but it tends to be in national forests on a very regulated schedule or uh, private lands owned by timber companies. Um, you don't have a lot of private people who own a couple acres logging their land anymore like you used to have. And this goes back to uh, the legacy effects that I talked about in an earlier video a while back. Uh, you know, it's worth remembering that the habitat that we use today and fish and hunt in even today, the habitat that we have in our aquatic ecosystems is the, you know, legacy of past land uses. And so you can imagine, you know, look at how beautifully forested this stream is. You can look all the way around, up and downstream, and just see, you know, trees as far as the eye can see. And this is not a national forest. This is just some kind of private land owned by somebody. Um, but it is fully wooded. Just imagine what this would have looked like a hundred plus years ago when all of this was logged. How might things have been different here? Well, I mean, just imagine the sun would be beaten down on this little creek. The water would be a lot warmer. Uh, there'd be nothing to hold back uh, sediment and, and mud coming off the banks during every rainstorm. It would be very, very different. And so the fish and the species that we fish for in these streams are ones, they're survivors. They are survivors of unpleasant and um, uh, unfriendly uh, habitat conditions that these streams underwent. And some of, the, some of the patterns of species presence and absence sometimes can be hard to be explain based on what we see today in the 21st century, but they are actually the product of what was going on in here in the 19th and 20th centuries before anybody was even looking for fish um, or really paying much attention to any kind of conservation. Conservation, once upon a time, was reserving uh, some kind of commodity for future use. And it wasn't, conservation was not a, a, a thought of preserving nature in its original or close to original um, condition. So it's easy to forget about that kind of stuff and I try to keep it in my mind, but I, I honestly forget sometimes uh, about, you know, you look at a stream, it's like just gorgeous and, and the water is so clear and you look for a particular fish or in, you know, in my case, it's been black bass forever, shoal bass or some kind of red-eye bass, either fishing or, or research and they're not there. And you have to wonder, well, why are they not there? It looks perfect, you know? I've, seen other streams where they look like this and they are there and uh, you know it's it's because of something that may have happened you know before the time of my grandparents that that wiped the fish out and they had never came back this is a common thing that we have to deal with in 21st century America it's something they've dealt with in Europe which is even more of an extreme case but they've dealt with it in Europe for Oh, a long, long time because people have been, you know, digging canals and building dams and and building cities along rivers and using them for as a dump 
for centuries and centuries over there darn close to a millennium in some of those cities and so uh, it's really hard to recreate what or to even imagine what some of those places look like we aren't quite to that stage here in America because we had so much land compared to the number of people living here and because our history is so recent um, could be a cautionary tale for what's in their future but but at any rate the legacies of, of past land use uh, one paper I read called it the ghost of land use past has come to define often where we do and do not find fish today I am in the Black Warrior Basin in Alabama and this is a one of the one of the best examples of this um, because the warrior bass um, that I'm fishing for today is one of the rarest black bass species on earth today and the reason is is because of all the coal mining that went on in this part of Alabama in this basin in particular in the Black Warrior Basin more so than the nearby or the adjacent Cahaba Basin um, coal was a big deal and so when we when we embarked on a project to try to define the current distribution of warrior bass we were astounded at the number of zeros that we would get in streams that looked awesome and uh, the only thing we could figure um, was that a lot of those streams are suffering from from coal mining effects that are the ultimate le ultimate legacy effect things that now a lot of these coal mines haven't been active for 50 or more years you know since I've been alive um, but their legacy lives on uh, they haven't been cleaned up very well and uh, every time it rains you get another flood of ions into the river uh, or the streams and it's not just warrior bass that are missing from a lot of these streams it's a lot of species of fish crayfish and mussels that have the same exact distribution patterns so it's a kind of a holistic thing but uh, that is a perfect example of dealing with the ghost of land use past is the warrior bass distribution it is no accident that most of the best warrior bass populations left reside within the boundaries of Bankhead National Forest which of course ha is one of the newer national forests I, I can't remember how old it is but it's not super super old maybe 80 or 90 years but it was logged often often before the the, the government gets a hold of the land to, to preserve it the, whoever owns it logs it before they hand it over to them um, so that was a likely scenario but uh, at any rate it's not logging in this case it's the problem it's the coal mines and despite the fact that it was not federal land forever and ever uh, for whatever reason no coal mines existed in the area that is now Bankhead National Forest and the uh, warrior bass generally thrives there although there's still a lot of problems with native intergression there as well um, which we think also could have something to do with uh, past land use um, and disturbed habitats but at any rate regardless when you're hiking up your favorite stream or even just taking a hike on your favorite path it's sometimes worth wondering well, what did this place look like a hundred years ago sometimes it's not as pristine as we like to think it is we like to think that you know we're everything is worse now than it was then and the truth is is that you'd have to go to the uh, pre-colonial um, times to really find pristine habitat particularly in the eastern part of the United States so there's some food for thought today from the banks of this beautiful creek in the Black Warrior Basin